Welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Santi, delighted to pray with you today, the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And let's do that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let's take a moment at the outset of Mass to consider our lives and to ask for God's mercy. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. In my thoughts and in my words, in what I've done, what I've failed to do, through my fall, through my fall, through my most grievous fall. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, God and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks to your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so we pray. Let us pray that God will forgive us all our sins and failings, and that he will bring us a sense of true peace. Father, your love for us surpasses all our hopes and desires. Forgive all our human failings, keep us always in your peace, and lead us to the way that takes us to eternal salvation. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground various wild animals and various birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called each one of them would be its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all wild animals. But none proved to be a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed its place with flesh. The Lord God then built into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of her man, this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two of them become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the fruit of your honey work, blessed shall you be unfavored. May the Lord bless us all the days of our lives. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home. Your children like olive plants 
around your table. May the Lord bless us all the days of our lives. Behold, thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May the Lord bless us all the days of our lives. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. May the Lord bless us all the days of our lives. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, he for a little while was made lower than the angels, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the leader to their salvation perfect through suffering. He who consecrates and those who are being consecrated all have one origin. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to perfection in us. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Lord, Glory to you, Lord. O Lord. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, what did Moses command you? And they replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch and bless them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he became indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen. I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God, like a little child, shall not enter into it. And then he embraced the children and he blessed, and he blessed them, placing his hands on them. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us on this 27th Sunday of Ordinary Time. If you're actually going to Our Lady of Lourdes this weekend, you would hear a, a guest speaker we're having, who in addition to all the priests is speaking, that's Chris Bell. Christopher Bell is one of the founders of something called Good Council Homes. I mention it because with all this constant debate and discussion about the right to life issue, the right to choice, at the end of the day, there are other people who say, look, the politics of it all will do what it's going to do. But in the meantime, if someone finds themselves in a unplanned or challenging pregnancy, 
it's really important that those of us who care about both the mom and their baby do what we can to help. And that's what Good Counsel and many other places around the country are doing. Some Catholic, some not Catholic. They're saying to a woman, if you're pregnant, you're scared, you have no place to go, come to us. And we will accept you and your baby and give you shelter and time for education. And if you need to hold a job, we'll take care of the baby while you're gone to work. There are all these homes like Good Counsel, and I'm not sure people always know that you can debate the issue of abortion all you want, but at the end of the day, what's most important is that we not only tell people don't have an abortion, but also that we say, and if you choose to have that baby, there are systems like Good Counsel, there are places, there are people that actually care and will do what they can to help. So I'm glad to welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes, Christopher Bell from Good Counsel Homes. All right, let's talk about these readings of the book of Genesis. One of the interesting things, you know, when I celebrate weddings, I always ask the couples if they will write an essay for me about why. Of all the people that could marry in the world, why is this the person? And they write beautiful essays. I love it. And I use that in the ceremony to make it more personal. To, to explain not just in generic terms about their love, but specifically what they love in each other. But one of the things I get a kick out of is so often they'll say, well, I know too that my boyfriend, my fiance is going to be a, a great husband and father someday because we have a dog and he's really good with the dog. Or they'll say she'll be a great mother because she's so wonderful with our puppy. And while I really respect and appreciate people being good to their pets, I had for 17 years Bailey, my little Jack Russell, and before that, we had uh, a Willie, the uh, dachshund. So we love our animals. I, I see that's, that's very powerful. But they're not the same as people. And in the book of Genesis, we say God creates all of creation and the, the animals and, and everything else in the world. And it's wonderful. But there's something missing. And so God brings to bear from his own self the first human being. But then realizes that Adam is very isolated, very alone. And that of our nature, we are called on to be people who share our lives with others. And so he creates that partner, that spouse for Adam, who is Eve. Very powerful, right? That, that all of creation is great. The, you know, the forests and the trees and the oceans and all that are beautiful. But that there's something more, port, more important than anything else. And that's the creation of the human person. And then in other places in Genesis, we'll actually hear God say, because these people unlike the animals and the trees and the forests and the, the oceans, these people are made in the image and likeness of God, which makes us very precious in his sight. He makes us individually one at a time. He gives us a dignity that is unique to us. We are precious in his sight. And I think this reading certainly identifies that, but there's more to this reading. Because then when he brings people into a spousal relationship, he is saying this is so powerful, the love that should bond a man and a woman, that they become no longer two people, but one flesh. And what's that got to do with you? Okay, if you happen to be blessed to be in a relationship, many of you who are watching have been married for many years, some of you recently married, some of you are just dating. But that special person that you have found in your life, very often over the course of time, if we're honest with each other, and after 44 years of listening to people in pastoral counseling, I hear this all the time, the love that originally existed, the thing I fell for, the, the reason I wanted to get married, has dissipated. It's become weaker. We're, we're kind of just living in the same house, but there's not relationship. You can't have that. And that's why God very specifically in Genesis says, they are no longer two, but one flesh. So I'm asking you, who are in relationship one with another, have you let the relationship that began with this deep and abiding love fade? Can you say that your husband, your wife, that you become part of one flesh, that you're so united, so much one as God made you one through the, the vows that you took, that you can say, we have our disagreements, we have our hard times, our bad times, but at the end of the day, I haven't forgotten him that the spousal relationship means now and forever an unconditional love where the two become as one flesh. Many of you see at weddings when you go there, the lighting of the unity candle, two candles to light the big one in the middle. The symbol comes from this passage. They are no longer two. They have become one flesh. So if you've lost the sense of being one flesh, we're just going through the motions. We're living in the same house. We don't communicate with each other. We don't tell each other that we love each other. This reading is a gentle reminder Go back to why you first fell in love. If possible, recapture that love. Realize you're not just two individuals isolated who live in the same house, 
but you're called on to renew that love regularly and to realize when God brought you two together, he took the two individual people and he bonded you in one great love. I don't want you to lose that love. I want you to recapture. You know, you can do that. It's not over. People say, well, how do I go back over that? You can. If you once again look at that wife, that husband and say, what is it I first fell in love with? And can I find once again in my heart the passion, the compassion to love that person like I once did? As long as we're alive, we can recapture and renew that love. We can become not two, but one flesh. Okay, let's go to this second reading. It's from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. That he might, that he might, I have to read my own hatred. Ah, that he might test, that he might taste death for everyone. Let's let's cut to the chase here. This experience of death, we can, you know, uh, make it sound like what's well, just passage to eternal life. We can make it sound like, you know, it's it's not the worst thing because, you know, ultimately we all die. It's awful. The experience of death and losing people we love is painful. It's it's never pleasant, and we can put the best spin on it if we want, but it's horrible. Nobody wants people they love to die. Nobody themselves says, I can't wait to die. The truth is, it's a passage from death to eternal life, but it's not easy. This past week, uh, a woman named Elaine Harmon, who was my assistant for 14 years and became also a treasured friend, passed away at the age of 80. But I have to tell you, um, we talked about this in our last lunch together. Much as she believed, and she did and does, she didn't want to die. She wanted to live and be with the people she loved. And I mention that because I think for most of us, if we're honest, even believing, even having faith, death is tough. Why do I mention that? Because Jesus knows that. He knows one of the hardest things for us to accept is the ending of the life of people we love or our own ending. And so he says, let me take on this human condition, not God in the sky, but also God as fully human. And let me share the journey completely. And, you know, you can't really share our human journey just by walking with us. You have to walk with us through all the experiences that are not pleasant, including death. And so God, in the person of Jesus, says, I will share even that journey with you. Even though, even though I'm God and I can eternally command all reality to myself, I choose to experience the pain and suffering on the cross of death. Because I want you to know that I'm not a God who can't relate. I am a God of true empathy. And just as you can't stand the reality of death of the people you love, and it's painful and it's hurtful, and none of us are running toward death ourselves, I want you to know that just as I in the Garden of Gethsemane said, hey, Father, if this cup can pass, if I can be spared from this horrible death, can't we do that? and ultimately realizes he's been called to walk the walk with us of all human experiences, including the experience of death. So he decides he will accept why he's in the world, to share everything of our human journey. We don't have a God who doesn't know that death is awful. We have a God who, the day before he's about to be betrayed, says, I'd rather not drink of this cup, namely death. But I'll do it so that all of my friends in the world know that their suffering and the challenges of sickness and death, these are things I can relate to. I walk their walk. I share their journey. I sojourn with them through it all, including the one thing they dislike the most, the experience of the death of people they love and their own personal deaths. Don't you see that when you and I pray to Jesus as friend and companion, He's somebody who gets our journey, who understands completely what we go through. I love people who have died. You do too. I didn't want them to die. I'd rather keep them with me. Well, Jesus had the same feelings. I am convinced that somewhere along the line when he lost St. Joseph, his foster father, that it hurt. I know that for Mary, watching her son die on the cross, there was an incredible pain. Jesus understood that. And he understands it so much that he shares our journey in every way in being tempted, just as we are, including our desire to resist the power of death and to go on living. Father, if this cup can be passed from me, so be it. But if not, thy will be done. And death is part of the journey. And because he loves us so much, because he has not just sympathy, but empathy for everything we suffer, so he's willing to share even that last painful step that we all go through. 
the experience of the death of people we love, and our own personal death. He shares it all. He's not God up in the clouds, far away from understanding what we go through. He's fully God and fully human. And being fully human, he knows every single struggle you and I share, including even the struggle of accepting and embracing death, much as we believe it leads to eternal life. Nobody wants to go through that passage. And so Jesus shared that passage with us all. Okay, let's go to the gospel, this great gospel. Um, this is a, a very complicated but not so complicated thing. You heard about annulments, right? You know about annulments. The church grants annulments that says that that marriage is dissolved. Some people don't like that the church does that, and they call it nothing more than Catholic divorce. But I see it much differently. Jesus is one tough cookie when it comes to marriage. Moses allowed the Jewish people to divorce and remarry. And Jesus says he did that because you people pressured him into it. But I'm going to tell you the truth. When you make that solemn promise to be married, it's forever. And anything less than that is a betrayal of the vows that you made. So Jesus is really somebody who's not giving anybody an out when it comes to marriage. You marry, enter into it seriously, take it seriously, be sure that person is as right for you as you can know. Because the words of Jesus are tough and demanding. So along comes the church that says, yeah, but we believe that if at the time the marriage happened, one or both of them was emotionally, psychologically, unable to understand the demands of marriage, that there was a precondition that existed that meant that that marriage could never work. And I have to tell you, and I hope I'm not upsetting all the couples I've had the joy of participating in their weddings, but I have to say, there's a whole lot of people over my 44 years of doing weddings that I'd say were in no way aware of the demands of marriage. They weren't ready. They were in love. They certainly romantically felt strongly for each other, but were they aware of the demands of marriage, the unconditional nature of love that's required to make marriage work? I don't think a good half of the couples that I got a chance to witness their wedding were really ready. So maybe the church is onto something, but more importantly, the church is offering a compassionate way for people who really should not be together to find a way to peacefully end their marriage and perhaps even be in love again with someone else. Is it Catholic divorce? I don't think so. Because we're not saying something happened after they got married that's the reason for their annulment being granted, but rather we're saying these two entered into marriage probably with good intentions, but without the stuff you need to make a marriage work. And there would be people who say, well, they should work it out anyway. And that would be ideal, wouldn't it? But we don't lead ideal lives, do we? We are who we are, imperfect as we may be. And I think the church shows compassion by saying, are you supposed to stay in a completely miserable and painful marriage? Or are you given the option of exploring the reality of what was going on when you first decided to marry? And were you truly ready? So yes, Jesus demands a lot of us, and certainly no one should enter into divorce lightly, because as I've said to you before in these homilies, divorce is never about either side winning. It's always about degrees of losing, because it's painful for everyone. But that doesn't mean the church doesn't give a compassionate way for people to find another path. So much so that, you know, one of the complaints about the church for years is that annulments cost a lot of money, and people couldn't afford it. So Pope Francis comes along and he says, no one should be denied the process of annulment because of money. If they are called, if they feel called to enter into this process as exploring annulment, they should be assisted by the church in that process. So I know, I know this is not easy, this whole concept of annulment. But I have to say that I think the church, by offering the possibility, is offering one more route to compassion. Jesus certainly wanted us to stay married and to remember that when you make those vows, the two become one. And nobody, not any husband, not any wife, not the church, not the Pope, and certainly not Jesus, wants that relationship to end. But neither do we believe that Jesus, who is the source of all compassion and love, wants people to be staying in abusive, horrible, painful relationships, which too often is the case. Okay, let's move on to a couple other things I wanted to talk about, if you bear with me, a couple of things. First of all, did you watch the vice presidential debate? Because I did. And I got to tell you, I liked it. And I liked it why. Those men don't agree on much. 
But the one thing they agreed on was you can be disagreeable on issues without being disagreeable personally. They respected each other. They listened to each other. Occasionally, they agreed with each other. They were gracious to each other. You compare that with so many other debates we've watched. Why can't we disagree with people? Now this goes to us in our own families, in our own communities. I have people who say, I haven't talked to my, my, my uh, son, my daughter, my sister, my brother in years. Because when it gets political, we turn into people who hate each other. No room for that. We can disagree without being disagreeable. And Mr. Walsh and Mr. Vance showed us how. It was wonderful. You know, uh, whoever you're for, it doesn't matter. It's just that to see two people remember to be respectful to one another and even to respect somebody else's ideas without becoming personal and ad hominem, that's a wonderful thing. It was a great lesson. I'm an old debater from high school and college, and I have to tell you, what I saw there was the way debate should go on. Let's disagree respectfully honoring one another's point of view, and always recognizing that I can say, I don't like your ideas, but I'm going to work to like you and respect you. Good lesson in that debate. Second thing I wanted to say, uh, Melania came out with a book this week, her biography, and I don't know whether it's for political purpose or personal, but she felt the strong need to say, you know, that she supports a woman's right to choose. And all I would say to Melania and to any person who says they support the right to choose, Melania, what's the best thing you ever did in your life? I'm going to guess it's not Donald. I'm going to guess the best thing in your life is Baron, that six foot seven son of yours who you are so proud of and you love so much. Well, here's the thing, Melania. He began as this tiny little cell. He began as this little zygote. He began as this little fetus and he grew into something wonderful. And every child terminated by abortion begins the same way. And just as you prize and treasure your son, Baron, So we're saying, that's all we're saying, every child deserves the same chance that your son had. Yeah, yeah, but I wanted that child. Well, has it come down to that? Will we decide that some life is valuable because I want it, but some life has no value because I don't want it, at least not right now? What I'm saying is, Melania, if you love your son, recognize that your son exists in every unborn child. Only you gave your child that right, and some people deny that right. Which brings me to Whoopi Goldberg, my final point. I don't know if you watch The View. I don't recommend it. Uh, Not a whole lot of intelligent discussion there and certainly not a fair and balanced approach. They have uh, four women who are completely to the left and they have somebody they call conservative, but to me, she's pretty moderately liberal. So it's not a fair and balanced presentation at all. But Whoopi decided this week she had to speak up on the abortion issue. So Whoopi, here's my response. First of all, when she's pointing at the camera and saying, you Christians and you Catholics, first of all, Whoopi, we Catholics, we're Christian. Don't separate us out. We're all part of the same family. We love Jesus Christ and what he stood for. And the same Jesus who in this gospel today says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. To such as these belongs the kingdom of God, says that our kids are pretty important. But Whoopi, For those who don't understand, and people just like to demonize her because she's so liberal and so out there and so pro-abortion and so willing to condemn those of us who call ourselves pro-life, you should probably read a book, and I read it years ago, and it helped me to understand her and others better. And it's called The Choices We Made. And Whoopi talks painfully at points about the multiple abortions she has had. And so for her to accept what we're saying, that life is sacred, that that baby has a right to life, that to terminate that life is a sinful, bad thing. She'd have to accept that in choosing to terminate her own pregnancies, multiple pregnancies, she was ending a human life. And I think for many people, they argue this point because to accept that is to accept a great burden on your heart and soul. And that's why we have in the Catholic Church confession, so that we can go and say, look, I did this thing years ago, I wish I hadn't, because the guilt and the pain have followed me my whole life. And I think what Whoopi's doing is what many people do. If you accept what those right-to-lifers are saying, those Catholics, Christians, and you believe that what's in the womb is human life worthy of development, then if you end that life, you have to look in the mirror and say, I took the life of another human being. And that is a hard, hard thing for anyone to accept. So I understand why she's so angry and so determined to tell us all what you Catholics and you Christians are wrong about. Because if we're right, that life is sacred from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death, 
and makes people like Whoopi have to take a hard and painful look. Why did I time and time again choose to terminate human life? And how do I live with myself knowing that that would be a full-grown person right now and that maybe my choice, painful as it was, was also something I have trouble living with? I think it's a beautiful thing in our church that we say that everyone is welcome to be reconciled. And I have personally listened to the confessions of literally thousands of women and their boyfriends and their husbands who chose the route of abortion over the years. And I, I cry with them and I share their pain because they know at the end of the day what abortion is and what it does. And whoopee, we're not some crazy right wingers. We're just people who say the most vulnerable people in our society are the unborn child. And we have to speak up for them. I think I told you all this once before, but I'll end with this. Governor Hugh Carey, the former governor of New York, uh, said to me once, I said, why were you pro-choice when you were governor, but then you became pro-life? He said, I always knew the truth, Monsignor. I am the parent. I am the father of 10 children. I know what Helen, my wife, was carrying in her womb. It was a baby. And so for political reasons, I chose to say it didn't matter. Abortion should be legal. But I know what abortion does because I'm a dad. And I know what my wife carried because she was a mom. And I'm just trying now in whatever years I have left to tell people the truth, that you do have a choice. But I hope and pray, he said, that the choice you make is a choice for life. And now as a people of faith and trust in the goodness of God, let's profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And trusting in the goodness of God, let's offer now our prayers of petition. Confident of our co covenant with God and our unity with our brothers and sisters, we present these prayers before God's throne that the church continue to guide and teach us in faith and be a living witness to the compassionate love of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the leaders of nations may protect the rights of all in their care and lead all in ways of peace, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That families will be filled with the graces that flow from marriage and parenthood and become true sanctuaries of life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Jill Anna, Amalia Renda, Frank Cassano, Fran and Nello Bonamico, Victorio and Sana, Myroslav Halecki, Frank Loria, Mary Esposito, Joe Falgiano, we pray to the Lord. Lord for all those, for all who have died, especially Joseph Nyes, Roseanne Robert, we pray to the Lord. Lord, For the intention of this Mass, deceased members of the Castoria family, Anthony Toro, Purgatorial Society, Dennis C. Donovan, Nicola Argentino, Anthony Toro, Philip W. and Philip P. Vaccaro, Aldo Luca, Santa Anzalone, Anniversary Intention of Vincent and Ellen Ricciuti. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let me add a few intentions for those who are sick. I want to pray for my friend Diane Nagel down in the Carolinas, who has undergone some special surgery, and for her well-being and return to good health. Among the sick, I also pray for Jose Josena. I pray for Glenn Hudson, for Joe Falgiano, for Bertica of Seattle and her daughter as well, for Tom Slade and Kathy Bordingo, for Judge Anthony Falanga, 
for Eddie Mullins and for Mary O'Brien, for Tommy Burke, my classmate and friend, for Tom and Patty Yanch, also classmates and friends. I pray for Katie O'Connor, I pray for Angelo and Al Clemente, for Leanne Lasanti, for Kimberly Cusack, for Christine Bauman. I pray for Michelle Leonhardt and Russell Castro Giovanni, for Vincent Rienza Jr., as well as uh, for Roy Citrano and Sam Maggio. I pray for Susie and Vinny Vignardi and their families. I pray for Richard Monaco. I pray as well for Herb Stadler and Judy Alaco and Larry Mayer. I pray for Richard Carbone. I pray for Janet Chevelle, Robert Talaska, Thomas Mistretta. Uh, I pray as well for Michael Hellam and uh, Carmela, Catherine, and Liliana, the twins who have been sick. I pray for Michael, who's been battling leukemia. I pray for uh, Sandra Slater and for Anne Marie de Blasio and Linda Madrigo and Dario Rivera. And I was praying for so long for Michael Chanover, and I heard this week that he has gone to God. I pray for Carol M. Uh, Carol Paolo Oshandi, for Kelly Lee Scibilia, and for Virginia Rivera. For Barbara and Ken Barsanti, Mary and Ken Johnson and family, Tommy Swingross. I pray for Sarah Belfi and Gus, I pray as well. Gus, you also went to God. I pray for Paulette Sewell and Terry and John Schiara and Maria and Bob Cariola. Pray for Melissa Olberg and Sal Manzo and Larry Lewis. I pray for the Parentine family and the McShay family as well, and for Velio Bronzini. Pray for Jack Campbell, as well as Mrs. Kalinowski and Linda and Frank Rosado. Among the sick, I pray as well for Ben Samanella, as well as George Rumi, and for Ralph as well. I want to pray, adding to the list of those who are sick, I pray too for uh, Howie Pomerantz, my friend Howie, uh, Josephine Romano. I pray for Rita Padden. I pray for uh, Richard Arturo. I pray as well for uh, Valerie Milderberger and her continued recovery. My friend Frank Savino. I pray too for Vinnie Rissuti. I just had a chance to visit Vinnie this week in the nursing home. I pray too for uh, Leanne Lasanti again. And also among the sick, let me pray for Melanie Jandovitz as well as Josephine Romano. And then I want to pray for those who have passed away. So let me mention them now. Richard Jennings. Craig Scott, Bessie and TC Center, Thomas Minter, Roland Rossi. I pray for Jenna Tuller, Margie Smith, Tessie Palmo. I pray for Phil Cordero and Frank Cazetto. I pray for Isabella Glauda, Billy and Michael Sarasoli and their father, Billy Sarasoli. I pray for Ray and Monica Carrison. I pray for Margaret O'Connor Lasanti and Bridget Clementi, especially on this the one-year anniversary of Bridget's passing, a great old friend who first made me welcome in her home along with Angelo when I was a newly ordained priest. As always, I pray for my mom, Cecilia Nicholas Losanti. I pray for Irene and Tom Romano, for Ed June and Eddie Jandovitz, and for Beverly Maggio. I pray too for Regina Brighton, Justino Amarin. I pray for Tom Sully O'Sullivan and Alfred John Sicali. I pray for Emilio Olaco and Paul Struzzieri and Maria and Albert Cavelli for Anna and Gary Gooms, for all the deceased members of the Vignardi family, for Diana Mestretta, as well as James and Rita Volpe. I pray for Joseph Sardone, for Gina Pelletier, for Emily LaFasso. I pray for um, Jim Bobrowski, as well as Chris Baumler. I pray for Betty Moore and Pauline Romano and Sylvia Christ, as well as Beatrice Ferrari. I pray for Millie Paradiso and Mary Rockensees for James C. Williams, as well as Suzanne Scanio and Brian Hussey, her dad, for Annette Salintro and Judge Donald Belfi and Thomas Peter Lopresti, for Joseph Walweber and Dennis and Joe Cooney, for Richard Jennings and Jamie Scotto and Pam Amadeo, as well as Gina Pelletier, Beatrice Ferrari, Chris Baumler once again. I pray for Pauline McKenzie's parents, as well as Jeanette Chanover, and Rosalie Salco, and for Gussie Sino. Let me pray for Sino. I want to pray for John, Helen, and Luke Marr. And let me add a few more names if I can to that list, if you'll bear with me and be patient with the old Monsignor. Hmm. 
It was just in my hands. Come on. I think you better put that on hold, folks. Okay, I got it. Among those who I'm also praying for who passed away, I want to remember Marie Tenay, a beautiful soul from our parish, much loved by many who went home to God last night. I pray for Marianne and Franco Alfonso. Uh, I pray as well for Michael Manzella and for Emily Lofaso and all the members of the Emilo family, Sal, Angelo, Guy, and Gaetano. I pray too for uh, Nick Martone uh, as well as for... Um, Jonathan Diller, the police officer, now detective, who passed away recently, a victim of violence in New York City. I pray for, pray for Glenn Mankin, as well as for Dick Rosmarin, and I pray for all the people we love who pass from this life to the next. In addition to all those names that I mentioned from my book, I want to add some this week. Linda Conboy asked if we can all pray uh, for Frank Loria. Frank lives in Florida, and he watches our masses regularly, and he's been going through a very sick period in his life. So, Frank Loria, we're praying for you, all our friends online. Among the sick, too, of course, I'm praying for Joe Falgiano, my good friend, who this coming week is entering into hospice, and uh, we pray for his journey. We pray for Kathy Bordengo and Kathy Sullivan and Carol Dunn. We pray for um, Judy Alaco and Stephanie and Howie Handelson, both of them, this great husband and wife that I had the privilege to marry years ago, going through their health challenges. Tom and Kathy Forbes, Vinny Rasuti, Anthony Lusage, Howie Pomerantz. I pray for Chrissy Rogers, Diane Nagel. I pray for Josephine Romano and Catherine Adams and Domenico Delia. I pray too for Deacon Frank Garibaldi, as well as Emma Brown and Edna Cruz and Adrina Sino. I pray for Mariah Malari uh, and all of those in military service and their well-being. I want to pray, too, um, for those who have died, and let me mention a few here. I want to pray first uh, for Gerard William Kressner. Pray for Gerard, as well as my friend Elaine Harmon, who, uh, as I mentioned, my assistant for 14 years, and my friend for much longer than that, who uh, all her time spent here in recent years has been spent being, taken, being a caretaker for her husband, Jim, who died this past year, and now she has joined them in heaven. I pray for, pray for Bill DeVito and Norma Calabrese and the, all the members of the Emelo family, for Judge Anthony Falanga and for Emily LaFaso and Tom Miller and Chris Baumler and John Slade and Gussie Sino. Pray for Michael Manzella and Chrissy Formato and Betty McCaffrey and Gina Pelletier and B. Ferrari and James and Robbie Purick. And uh, I pray too for all of our friends who have passed. And then there's some new ones that came in, so let me mention some special intentions. Uh, Dr. Howard P. Fritz, my friend down in Dade City, Florida, has many intentions that he's asked me to pray for, which I do, and I pray as well for my friend uh, Sonia Mayer, uh, who has asked me to pray for a special intention. I do, and then I want to pray too for my friend. Uh, this is a great one. I want to share it with you this letter because it says to the good people who watch our mass. Hello, Monsignor Jim. Uh, she's asking first of all that I would be well. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, and she said, I look forward to, I ask Blessed St. Joseph, Blessed Virgin Mary and her son Jesus to look out for you and bless you with improved health. Thank you, Martha. And then she said, my pledge is a nightly effort for the rest of my life, but she says there's a catch. I'm going to be 89 in June, so my time is limited, <laughs> meaning you have to be well, well before then. Uh, secondly, she said, thank you for always including me on the list of people who are sick. Uh, especially for my macular degeneration. Please remove my name from your list to make room for other people in need. And third, she said, uh, please accept this donation to Our Lady Lord's Parish, um, and thank you for that. And she says, remember I talk about naps and how important they are, so she talks to that. And you speak of naps. A quality nap is when you reach your bedroom, you close the door, take off your shoes, and lay on top of the bed. Naps on couches or recliners do not count, do not work. With great respect, Martha R. McGuire from Las Cruces, New Mexico. So Martha, all your intentions we remember. And then uh, my friend Ron Zimmer, praying for your whole family and for your continued well-being in the uh, past fight you've had with cancer. And then what did I get? Oh, yes, my friend Berta Grafeo asked us to keep on praying for her husband, Joe, who's uh, been dealing with uh, Parkinson's, as well as her mother, who just turned 102. And finally, I just want to pray for all the uh, Paratine family who live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they're regularly with us on the Mass, and they ask us to please keep 
all of those in our family men, uh, prayed for, as well as the McShays, so we do that. I said that was the last one. I wasn't completely honest. My friend Annette Sullivan from Elmont, New York, was in touch to say, please pray in your special intentions for John and Claire Sullivan, which I do. I also pray for all of our men and women in the armed forces and for peace in the Middle East. I want an end to the violence there. I pray for our friends in Ukraine, that they might be free of the oppression of the attacks from Russia. I pray for our, our friends who want freedom in Taiwan and Hong Kong. I pray for doctors and nurses and orderlies and those who keep us healthy. I pray for teachers and the important work they do in forming and shaping the future generations. I pray especially for teachers in religious education throughout the country, throughout the world, who share the gift of faith with our young people. I pray too for um, our first responders, our police, our firefighters, our EMTs. God bless them and thank, thank you, Lord, for the gift that they bring us and giving us protection, especially in times of trial. I pray for your special intentions and mine. I pray for everybody who tries to embrace the vocation of marriage. As one rabbi friend of mine calls it, he calls it the tough way out. And so it is, the hard way out. And yet, as Jesus says, it is a, a true sacrament where two become one. I'm praying for all of you who have been married. And now let's join together in giving all these intentions over to the Mother of God, as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink, Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Father in heaven, receive these gifts which our Lord Jesus Christ has asked us to offer in his memory, and may our obedient service bring us all the fullness of your redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father in heaven, it is right that we should give you thanks and glory. You are the one God living and true. Through all eternity, you live in unapproachable light. You are a source of life and goodness. You have created all things to fill your creatures with every blessing and to lead all people to the joyful vision of your divine light. Countless hosts of angels stand before you to do your will. They look upon your splendor and they praise you night and day, united with them. And in the name of every creature under heaven, we too praise your glory as together we pray. your greatness and all your actions show your wisdom and your love you formed us in your own likeness you set us over the whole world to serve you our creator and to rule over all creatures and even when we disobeyed you and lost your friendship 
You did not abandon us to the power of death, but helped all people to seek and to find you. Again and again, you offered a covenant to us, and through the prophets taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. He was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, a man like us in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to those in sorrow joy. In fulfillment of your will he gave himself up to death, but by rising from the dead he destroyed death and restored life, and that we might live no longer for ourselves but for him. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as his first gift to those who believe to complete his work on earth and to bring us the fullness of grace. Father, may this same Holy Spirit now bless and sanctify these offerings. Let them become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He always loved those who were his own in the world. And when the time came for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, he showed the depth of that love. While they were at supper, Jesus took bread. He blessed the bread and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. We proclaim the death of God and profess your resurrection until you come, until you come again. Father, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption. We recall Christ's death, his descent among the dead, his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And looking forward to his coming again in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the acceptable sacrifice which brings salvation to the whole world. Lord, look upon this sacrifice which you've given to your church and by your Holy Spirit gather all who share this one bread and this one cup into the one body of Christ a living sacrifice of praise. Lord, remember those for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people everywhere. Remember those who take part in this offering, those here present, and all your people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember those who have died in the peace of Christ and all the dead whose faith is known to you alone. Father, in your mercy, grant also to us, your children, to enter into our heavenly inheritance in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with your apostles and martyrs and saints, and then in your kingdom, freed from the corruption of sin and death, we shall sing your glory with every creature through Christ our Lord, through whom you give us everything that is good. For it is through him, with him, in him, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all glory, all honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Certainly, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus struggled with accepting and doing the will of the Father. And then he teaches us this powerful prayer, the Lord's Prayer, where he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It wasn't easy for the Jesus who walks with us in his human journey and with our human journey. It's not easy for us to say and to mean that either. That we might, like Jesus, ultimately trust the will of God and do it in our daily lives. 
Let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's share that peace with one another. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Join me in our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Not too many announcements today. One of them would be, wherever you happen to be, if you heard me talk before about the work of Good Counsel Homes, or all those homes that are out there saying to women, you do have another choice and you want to support that, you can just send a uh, donation to Good Counsel. That's what it's called, Good Counsel Homes. Uh, and send them to me here at Our Lady of Lourdes. And Father Kevin always puts at the end of Mass the actual address to write to and make your check out to Good Counsel Homes. That would be a good thing. Every day it helps, as so many places do, like the Life Center here on Long Island. They're there to say, you do have another choice. Don't be frightened. We're going to give you all the support you need to have and support and raise up your child. So think about that. And then I um, also wanted to mention, what did I want to mention? This, this week we're, we're celebrating. Father Kevin's going to be out on the lawn on the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi to bless the animals. So if, if you have an opportunity in your parish, wherever you may be, to bring your, your pet 
to the uh, church to be blessed, by all means do that. I did it often for Bailey, my 17-year good friend, and Jack Russell. Very smart, very smart. I think he might have been smarter than me from day to day. So um, we want to bless the animals. But always realize that the ones made in the image and likeness of God are people who deserve respect and love, as do the animals too. Okay, and also, personally speaking, with Monsignor Jim Lasanti, either go on Sirius XM, the Catholic channel, and listen to us, or just go to your computer and under the heading, type in personally speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti on YouTube. This week, Father Brian Jakubowski, if you happen to be willing to admit that you watched Jeopardy, you saw him last week as a contestant on the show. So I thought this man who was ordained, he's ordained like half a year. He's a newly ordained priest. Wonderful guy. Why, why did he become a priest? He's normal. He's, he's smart. He's a good-looking guy. He could do many other things. He chose priesthood. So that's what we talk about on the program. Why Father Steve? Father, it's Father Steve. Why did you say Father Brian? Yeah, it's Father Steve Jakubowski. Why he would become a priest. So that's what we talk about on this week's Personally Speaking. And then next week is an actress, uh, Debbie Gravitt wonderful Tony Award-winning actress who talks about, of all the things she's done, her movies, her television, her stage performances, what's the best thing she ever did was getting married and having her three children. That, she said, is ultimately the greatest gift of my life. Not the awards, not the acting, as much as she loves that, but raising up these three beautiful children and enjoying a wonderful life with her husband. So Debbie is our guest next week. Join us on Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, let the Eucharist we share fill us with your divine life, and may the love of Jesus Christ, which we celebrate here, touch our lives and lead us always to you and to one another. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Is the scepter is the throne? Alleluia! Is the triumph? Is the victory alone? Hark the songs of peaceful Zion. Thunder like a mighty flood, Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us by his blood.